Every four years, the world watches. Every corner kick, every save, every pass. The world watches its most beautiful game played at its highest level. And for a moment, the world stops turning for soccer. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank sponsor of FIFA World Cup 2026. Supporting possibilities turned into achievements on the biggest stage. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America and a member of Jesse. From the Delta Sky Club. Welcome back, Ms. Klein. To the Jet Bridge. Delta Airlines relies on 5G solutions from T-Mobile for business to power operations and serve customers faster. Together, we're putting 5G into the hands of ground staff so they can better assist on-the-go travelers with real-time information throughout the airport. This is elevating customer experience. This is Delta Airlines with T-Mobile for Business. Take your business further at tmobile.com slash now. It's time for a big blue kickoff live. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it because you did. On Giants.com. You know what I saw? New York Giant Prime. And the Giants mobile app. 17-14 is the final. One touchdown, we are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. Part of the Giants Podcast Network. Let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs. Have some fun. Welcome into a Wednesday edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. Thanks for being with us. My name is Madeline Burke. He's a Super Bowl champion, Sean O'Hara. The phone number here is 201-939-4513, or find us on Twitter at hashtag GiantsChat. And as a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, as well as podcast platforms everywhere and at Giants.com slash podcasts. Wow, I got a frog in my throat already. <laughs> it is week eight. We're not even halfway through the season. But you know what? We're halfway through the week. And uh, we got a Monday night football matchup to prepare for. But before we get started, I want to apologize that I know our show is starting late today. As we tweeted out, I hope you guys saw. Um, I know the show is usually scheduled for 1230. We're getting yeah. a one o'clock start because we had some media availabilities from players. Sean, you had a little chit chat with Azizo Jalari. Yeah, yeah. Guilty as charged right here. We called an audible. <laughs> I was not tardy. I was mm-hmm. interviewing Aziz Ojolari, um, and we had a little fun one-on-one interview on the field. So um, that was why we had to push things back. So we appreciate you guys adjusting. Um, I think the the really cool thing about talking to Aziz is just like I could feel the excitement in his voice and his energy ever since Kayvon Thibodeau went down. Obviously, you don't ever want to see a teammate get injured, but now this opportunity has been created for Aziz, and he has maximized it. I mean, he's been phenomenal. Um, right out of the gate in his first game filling in. I mean, he was in the backfield. I think he had two sacks in that first game. Um, he's been in the backfield the entire time. So I could feel the energy, and we talked about the Monday Night Football. Like, that's – I remember growing up, and Monday Night Football was, like, the king. It was, like – I think it was Summerall and Madden, and, like, to get to play on prime time, that, like, that was really special. So uh, we talked about that a little bit, um, and he's jazzed up, and he also is going to be going up against a, a, a fellow Georgia Bulldog. And Broderick Jones, who has not been playing great um, as of late, and um, actually he's kind of had to had to battle some questions about his lack of uh, lack of technique. Um, Mike Tomlin actually just came to his defense, um, Broderick Jones' defense, um, just today, and talking about his play. So that'll be a good little matchup to watch. But um, yeah, you could catch that interview on the Dable Show. There you go, Coach Dable's show, which is going to be airing on the Giants YouTube channel as well as MSG Networks for those local to the New York, nice New Jersey media audience. You know, we're here to plug our content, yeah. our colleagues over here, the excellent work that is uh, that is done on these shows. Um, Aziz Ojolari is also, you know, contributing to this Giants defense that is leading the league in sacks. Um, Dexter Lawrence, though, I mean, already we're seven games into the season. We're in week eight, and there's like – defensive player of the year smoke because the Mm. fact that he's not only leading the giants but also the league in sacks at the nose tackle position that's pretty wild it is wild and you know you kind of go back to like all right when was the last time an interior defense lineman had this much of an impact and had this much production and it was aaron donald and Mm -hmm. so you look at it and it's like all right well aaron donald's a three technique you know yes he's not an outside edge rusher but he's making this impact and he's so fast and explosive Dexter Lawrence, you don't really think of him as like, man, this guy's a pass rusher. He's kind of taking up both A-gaps. You know, he's more, you would think of him as more of like, hey, I'm a run stuffer. Um, Sometimes those guys come off the field on third down. 
not Dexter Lawrence. I mean, he's he's doing both. You know, yeah. he and he's such a massive human that um, I, I yeah. remember playing against Ted Washington um, back when he played for the Bills. He played for the Raiders at the time. And I remember coming off the field and Pat Flaherty, Flats, our line coach was like, hey, which A-gap was he in? The front side A-gap or the back side A-gap? And I'm like, both. <laughs> like he, was, he was like a planet in there. Yeah. I'm like, I'm pretty sure he had both A-gaps covered. That's Dexter Lawrence. So, um, you know, he does have the versatility. He's playing the shade, uh, which that's a tough matchup, him one-on-one versus center. Um, you know, you're giving up probably 55 pounds, but he's so darn quick. Um, and then they do move him out a little bit. You know, so he plays against the guards as well. But what Dexter has been doing is, you know, it's phenomenal. I mean, the fact that the Giants are leading the league in sacks. I remember when we signed and traded for Brian Burns, and everybody talked about his production and his impact and how that's going to help. And the one thing that we kept associating it with was, well, look, you've got the edge rush guy. You need somebody to push the pocket, and you already had him in Dexter Lawrence. Yeah. That's going to be a great relationship, a very symbiotic relationship. And, you know, we've seen the production. I think we thought the production was going to come from Burns. Right. But it's really come from Dexter Lawrence. He's playing out of his mind. And it's, it's fun to watch. And I know you love the dance. Well, and it's, yeah, I definitely love the dance. I do it on the show sometimes, <laughs> uh, much to the chagrin of the show's producers. But you know what? It's okay. Got to give the people what they want. More sexy Dexy dance. I'm even chair doing it right now. Um, <clears throat> I know Pearson over there snort laughing at how ridiculous this is. He wants to um, do too. You know what there though? Uh, yeah, see Pearson, you it's can't contagious. see it, not pictured, but Pearson over there just hitting the sexy dexy in the swivel chair. So, uh, just want to give some flowers to Dexter Lawrence. Nine sacks through seven games. The next uh, closest interior defensive lineman has four. So just kind of a, a show and, and just the production that he's getting now. Um, Giants defense has their work cut out for them this week. Monday Night Football facing the Steelers, a team that you know has made the change from Justin Fields to Russell Wilson, put him in at quarterback. And last week, week seven, they're on Sunday Night Football in prime time playing against the Jets. And that first half, you know, Steelers are down. Russell Wilson looks off. It seems like every opportunity they could, the cameras would cut over to Justin Fields on the sideline with his helmet on, ready to go, and you're thinking, okay, are they going to change to Fields in the second half? Are they going to go back to him? But then, you know, Russ finds his groove, starts cooking. We see that moon ball in full effect, as Collinsworth likes to call it. Uh, Just that deep, accurate, high-arching pass that he is so good at, that touch that he's got. And this is going to be a real challenge, not just for the Giants' pass rush, but for the secondary that's had some ups and downs through the season. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, look, for, for Russell to come in and all of a sudden now the uh, Steelers offense just, it seemed like it opened up. Like George Pickens came to life and all yeah. of a sudden they're completing these deep throws. And um, that moon ball, you know, you, if you were watching the game, the broadcast calls were talked about, it, it makes it such a hard pass to defend because it's not, when you call it a moon ball, it's not just how high it gets, but it's the fact that the ball turns over and the way that it drops in. It's not like if it's a a lower trajectory pass, that defender can get his hand up there and knock it down. But when it comes down from the sky, like like rain, um, that makes it so hard to defend. And and it's amazing what Russell did with this offense. Back-to-back weeks, the Steelers now have scored 32 points or more, 37 points against the Jets, who I think a lot of people thought the Jets were one of the best defenses in the league um, coming into this season for sure. That obviously now... (laughs) you know, is going to be a big point of emphasis. I think before Russell Wilson entered as the quarterback, you would have said the Steelers is a run first offense. Like they, you got to stop Najee Harris. Um, You know, you got to find a way to contain Justin Fields. Now it's almost like the script has been flipped. Now look, they're, they're airing the ball out. Fryermuth is a stud down the middle of the field. I mentioned Pickens on the outside. Najee Harris, you still have to tackle him. They like to get him sprinkled into the, uh, the screen game as well. So this offense is is definitely much improved from the Steelers' offense, even the pr- previous couple of weeks. That, to me, is this the biggest part of this game. Can the Giants score points? I feel like we've sat here every single week and talked about, is this going to be the game mm-hmm. that they kind of get over the hump? We saw it in Seattle. Yeah. Thanks thanks to the block field goal for a touchdown, but like we're still waiting for that breakout game offensively, and they have definitely played better on the road. Let's hope that that stays true on Monday night. Well, and going up against the Steelers' defense, though, that has allowed an average of 14.4 points per game, uh, the second fewest in the National Football League is going to be hard to put points on the board. Um, I mean, that's just a fact right there. And, you know, you mentioned the difference between Russ and, and Justin Fields. One of the big differences, obviously, is Fields is more of a mobile running quarterback. Russ can send it. And I think, you know, you saw on Sunday Night Football there were some moments in which had 
Fields been in, he would have taken off, used his legs, got the first down, moved the chains yeah. that way. You know, Russ is more somebody who's going to stand back there and kind of survey the field and wait for the passing game to open up to him. How, as a Giants defense, you know, when you know that about your quarterback, that he's not going to just kind of take off to move the sticks, how does that affect the way you play him? Yeah, it's twofold, and you kind of touched on it before. The coverage has to be better because Russell, is he's kind of running – to buy time to throw the ball, whereas Justin Fields was more, he was running like boom. As soon as he decided to run it, he's tucking that ball. He's going. Yeah. Russell, he's an escape artist, but he's also he's really looking to throw the ball, and he wants to get out of the pocket. He wants to make those big plays and stress your defense. So, the challenge is all right. We want to get pressure on the quarterback, but we want to keep Russ in the pocket. We don't want to let him get outside. That's when your your secondary gets stressed, and it's harder to stay in those coverage lanes and have you know if you're playing a zone that all of a sudden gets gets tweaked if you're playing man you've got a plaster um, and it's harder to do that when he's out outside the tackle box um, so you want to try to contain him you want to rush him and pressure him but keep him in the pocket don't let him get outside um, you know I think the, the the one thing with Russell too is you can't just get there like you got to bring him down like even he's done a great job he's got this little baseball roll that he kind of fakes inside and spins out out of it um, he's not an easy guy to bring down as well. So um, we kind of saw him revert back to a little bit of the dangerous that we mm -hmm. saw in Seattle. Um, that has been dormant, you know, with his stop in Denver. But, you know, he's definitely someone that you've got to either have a spy rusher on or, you know, we saw this rear its ugly head against Cincinnati when Joe Burrow had that 42-yard touchdown run. If you're not in your rushing lanes and you've got to find a way to everybody's got to be in their lanes, keep their gap integrity so you're not letting him gash you with a big run. Absolutely. And we'll see how it all plays out Monday Night Football. But Giants fans, make sure you go and subscribe to the Giants Huddle podcast. It features long-form interviews with Giants players, coaches, and front office staff, past and present. Plus, hear from the best analysts covering Big Blue and the NFL. Search for Giants Huddle and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or Go to Giants.com slash podcast. And don't forget, if you are on Apple Podcasts, leave a five-star positive review for all of our Giants podcasts. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we head to the phone lines. We've got Dylan in New Jersey holding on line one. Dylan, welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live with Sean O'Hara and Madeline Burke. What's up? So I, I think that what I noticed in last game is that we took out one, one, one of our linemen and we did, we did really bad. And we could have put in an extra tight end or a running or the running back to block, but we, we chose not to and we paid the price. That's a good thought, Dylan. Uh, I, I appreciate I appreciate the call too. And I mean, like you said, you could have thrown in a, a tight end or running back to block. I, we did see, you know, having you know many occasion a tight end chip blocking in that situation. You saw Singletary get involved. Uh, or young callers calling in, joining the show, Sean. What is your impression on the Giants' offensive line play in Week Seven? I love Dylan's question. I love his attention to detail. Like he already he knows that we had Josh Azudu in a left tackle, mm -hmm. and like anybody that understands concepts, hey, we got to help him. So are we going to put a tight end in there and chip? We got to put a running back in there and chip. The first sack of the game that Azudu actually let up, he had a tight end chip his guy. So there was help there, and he just, you know, he had a bad set and he got beat to the outside. So um, I think they were definitely trying to help Azudu. But as the game went along, I thought Josh actually settled in nicely and he started to play better. Um, and then all of a sudden, we started to have some cracks and some, some breakthroughs on the other side. I thought Greg Van Roten um, got beat a couple times. Jalen Carter, I mean, he was the third overall pick a couple years ago. Um, they have some studs inside, and I thought that that collectively, I thought that was the worst game for this entire offensive line. And they have been stellar all year long. We have not had to talk about them really. We didn't start talking about them until Andrew Thomas got hurt, and that's right. a good thing. As an offensive lineman, if they're not talking about you, you're doing your job. So, um, Dylan, I, I love the point about it. I think you know you could only give a guy so much help. I mean, you don't want to put him on an island and ask him to pass block 25 times one on one by himself. So they're going to find ways to help out Josh Azudu, um, especially this week with T.J. Watt. Um, T.J. Watt's on a little bit of a he's on a little bit of a sleeper here. He doesn't have a sack in the last two games, which scares me as an offensive lineman because they usually come in bunches. So right. if you've got a guy that's been on a little bit of a drought, like here comes the storm. Um, they will definitely help him out. I also will, will just I have a question for Dylan. Like it's one twenty 
are you are you not in school? Are you calling me from school? Are you being homeschooled? Like, how is it that you were able to just make that call on a Wednesday? I just checked my calendar. It is not a holiday, so I don't know what's going on. I love that you're locked in. I just hope you're not missing any class by calling in. It's one of those put the thermometer on the light bulb in the morning. Like, I don't feel yeah. good. I got to stay home and listen to BBK. Are you Ferris Bueller and everybody <laughs> right now? Did you just fake something to stay home? I respect it. I respect it. I you know what? Real fan life right there Dylan in New Jersey we appreciate it um you know when you look at the way the offensive line is though last week and in, in Andrew Thomas's you know the news came out that Andrew Thomas was done for the season Dable said you know the, the things that they were thinking of was a Zudu in the left tackle spot or perhaps moving Jermaine Illuminor to left tackle and then putting Evan Neal in at right tackle when you look at the matchup this week with the Steelers you mentioned TJ Watt TJ Watt oftentimes lines up uh, opposite the right tackle so you yeah. it almost feels like you'd want to keep Illuminor on that side um, instead of kind of shaking things up because Illuminor and Van Roten have a really good chemistry not just from this year but you know from their time together in Las Vegas with the Raiders and you want to make sure that that right side is shored up against you know the Steelers one of their strongest pass rushers yeah I don't, I don't anticipate any changes with the lineup you know and I, and I think anytime you could put one guy in and not disrupt the other side um, I think that's beneficial for everybody. Like you just mentioned, you know, they're all that right side's got, you know, they've played well together. They've got the communication down. That's going to be even more paramount as you go into Pittsburgh on a Monday night football, like that scene and the crowd noise, like that's something that you don't want. Now all of a sudden you've got two tackles playing in new positions and you're dealing with the silent count. So um, I don't anticipate any change with that. I think Josh, like I said, he settled in. I think he played a little bit better as the game went along. But I will say, you're going on the road. You're playing in Pittsburgh. Please don't start the game with six three passes. Like you're, the crowd noise is going to be a factor. Like we need third and five or less, the first couple of possessions of the game in order to convert. We have not been able to convert, and a lot of it's been because we're third and ten, third and twelve. Um, th those are tough downs to convert on. So um, I, I think you know you're kind of going into the bee's nest right now with the Steelers and those terrible towels are going to be all over the place and they're going to be all juiced up because they've been hanging out at the point since 4 o'clock p.m. on Monday. Um, they're going to be all lubed up by the time they get into the stadium. I'm pretty sure it's AccuSure Stadium. Yeah. Um, that, that place is for sure it's going to be rocking and rolling. So you want to try to get them to settle down a little bit and I think you got to run the football. Uh, initially, you've got to start out, be physical, let your offensive linemen kind of be on attack mode, and then start to sprinkle in some pass and some play action. Yeah, and I mean, especially in two of the oldest franchises in the National Football League, let's get some vintage three yards and a cloud of dust run yeah. game going on. Yeah, we got to make this game bloody. We yeah. Gotta, like, we got to slow it down. Like, we, we're not – the Giants – to, to try to think that they're going to go into the Pittsburgh right now and score 30-plus points, like that's just not realistic. We scored 10 points in the last two games combined. So they, they've got to muddy this game up as much as possible. Um, and, and I think offensively the best way to do that would be to start out with the ground and pound. Also, fun fact, this is a family affair matchup on Monday Night Football, as you know. I mean, Kate Mara, who's been yeah. a guest on the Eli Manning and Sean O'Hara Eli Manning show, mm -hmm. uh, and her sister Rooney Mara, their parents. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure Rooney was named after the yeah, Rooney family. The Rooney there, family. There's, there's yeah. I mean, Tim, Tim Mara and Kathleen Rooney and, you know, married and had two kids and all that kind of stuff. So this is definitely, there's ties deeper than just vintage NFL right here. Um Random fun fact for you on a Wednesday. <laughs> uh, but we'll see how it all goes. Uh, all right. Oh, what do you think of the Corgi races? Oh, my gosh. So elite, by the way. We talked about the Corgi races last week on the show. If you guys didn't listen, you're missing out. Um, first of all, if you don't know, Corgi's butts float. Um, they they do, and uh, I was very happy to show Pearson and Georgie and some of our other um, production staff some videos to show you. Uh, just even if you try to push their bums right down, they just whoop right mm. back to the top. Buoyant booties, those corgis. But um, they had some races at halftime of the game last week at MetLife Stadium, and you know what? It's it sparked joy. I will say. I missed it. Yeah. I, I missed the races. Um, where where was it like? Westminster dog show like where that was it like slalom stuff did there was an obstacle course was it frisbee catching like what was the it was, what was just, the Olympics? It was just a little it was just a little sprinting sprinting action so it was just right? flat just out running some zoomies <laughs> little corgi zoomies on the field uh i mean what uh, who, who wouldn't be joyful after watching some of that right did, did, did they get in the end zone 
<laughs> I feel like they could have scored if we got gave them a football. No? That would have been nice. That would have been nice. Somebody's somebody did. Yeah. Every four years, the world watches every corner kick, every save, every pass. The world watches its most beautiful game played at its highest level. And for a moment, the world stops turning for soccer. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank sponsor of FIFA World Cup 2026. Supporting possibilities turned into achievements on the biggest stage. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America and a member of Jesse. Uh, Giants fans, speaking of MetLife Stadium, take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 season. To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. 201-939-4513 is the phone number. As we head back to the phone lines, we've got Lou in Virginia on the line. Lou, you're on BBK with Sean and Madeline. Hey, good afternoon, guys. How are you today? Doing well. How are you, Lou? It, I'm good. It pains me to say this, but I think that Charlie might be right for the first time in any time I've ever heard him call in about Mr. Jones. I think that he probably would do better with a fresh start somewhere else. I don't think he's a guy for us. I really don't. I know that a lot of the stuff that's happened wasn't all his fault, especially the fact that we can't seem to hold on to passes anymore. I don't understand what happens there. Um, and I know that changing coaches is not the way to go, but I think we may need a fresh start there as well. I also agree with you, Sean, on the fact that I didn't understand us passing the ball ten times in a row on Sunday afternoon was ridiculous to me. Um, and we can't keep force-feeding Malik all the time. Other guys have to be available and be able to make plays or else – we're never going to get anywhere with our offense. So I'll take the rest of it offline, and thank you guys for doing a great job. Thanks so much for the call, Lou. All right. Thanks, sweet Lou. Appreciate it. Um, I, I missed the Charlie thing, so I'm not, I'm not privy to that, I'm that not, call. I'm but not either, yeah. Just based on what Here's he was so saying, you know like he... I'm going to gloss over kind of the first aspect that Lou brought up because that's, to me, an off-season qu- like debate. Like, we want to talk about Daniel Jones next year. Like, we'll deal with that in January. Um, look, he's our best option to win. He's our best quarterback right now. So, like, any other – talk about anybody else playing like drew lock can't do what daniel jones can do so i don't want to hear that um like daniel jones he 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 can play better you know and i think he'll be the first one to tell you that but it's not all on him and this is not me like like defending daniel jones because i think there are plays where he has missed throws he has missed reads and you know you can walk turn on the film and you see it's like hey you know what you need to be better at this situation but yes i mean at what point through the first three to four weeks of the season, we were leading the league in drops. So you can't ask him to throw it and catch it as well. I think Giselle quoted that, um, <laughs> you know, when Tom Brady threw that pass in the Super Bowl. Um, so it's it's not just all on him. And, you know, offensively, that like, it's just things are not clicking. Whether he's forcing it, whether he's, you know, a little bit tight with some of the stuff, whether he needs to let it loose. Maybe, you know, everybody says, well, we want to see more down the field throwing. Look, he tried that against Philly too, and, you know, they were in coverage. So it's it's tough. And look, Malik Neighbors is their most explosive player right now. And you, I don't care if you force feed him the ball. Like he said, look, if I'm open, like give me the rock. And that's really what you do. It is the offensive coordinator's job. It's Kafka's job. It's Dable's job to find ways – to put new wrinkles into the game. Give him the ball in a jet sweep. Like, you turn on the 49ers offense, and, you know, when Debo was healthy, he was in the backfield. You know, he was taking screens. Put Malik Neighbors in the backfield. Throw a screen pass to him. Make him a running back. Like, there's ways to get creative to get him the ball so that he's not just in the same spot and you're not forcing him into coverage or teams are bracketing him. So there is some opportunity to get creative. Now, the problem is you can't get creative on third and thirteen. So the pre-snap penalties, you know, you get a, a false start. You get, um, you know, we had a touchdown taken back by offensive pass interference. Mm-hmm. We had a big play by Slayton a couple <clears throat> weeks ago taken back for an offensive lineman down the field. Those are all self-inflicted wounds, and that's what's most frustrating right now. The Giants still have not put together an A game on offense. They have not played a clean game, and this team is not a great team right now, offensively I'm speaking. They are not – a good enough team that they can overcome all of those mental mistakes and penalties and bad plays. Like they have to go on a 14 play drive to score a touchdown right now. The explosive plays are not there. 
And you've got you can only do that if you're not shooting yourself in the foot, if you're not creating penalties, if you're not having guys miss a block or guys miss a hole. So that's really where the emphasis is. And you know, look, they all need to wear it. It's not mm-hmm. just on the quarterback, it's not on the running back, it's not on the receiver, it's not on the left tackle. It's everybody. And it's that collective effort that needs to get better. Yeah. And you know, watching the game last week, one of the things that stood out to me as well is the difference in the time. I mean, Malik Neighbors after the game said, Hey, I was open. You know, you watch I, I was open. And yes, you know, there were a lot of instances which he was open, but Daniel Jones did not have the time that he has had in the previous six weeks. And yes, there was a change at left tackle, but it felt like the line as a unit struggled more than they have. And, you know, when you just, it's like replacing the pinky on the finger, the whole hand struggles. How would you, I mean, did you notice that? Was that something that kind of felt like he didn't have the, the time and the comfort in the pocket that he had had in previous games, which made it harder, not just getting the ball deep down the field, but just getting the ball out. Yeah, you could pull up some of the sacks. I think there was eight sacks uh, in, eight, in yeah. the game. And yeah. there's times where, yes, you know, there's there's somebody open and DJ can't get the ball to him because he's getting harassed or he's avoiding a block, a linebacker or a defensive end. It wasn't just the offensive line. You know, we talked about this on the post-game show. Devin Singletary was supposed to block the linebacker, and he went in and tried to cut block him, and he didn't get him down. And he ends up sacking, you know, Daniel Jones. So there's one on the running back. You know, tight ends are involved in pass protection as well. Um, John Michael Schmitz gave up a sack, and it was really an easy blitz. They were in an under front. He had a shaded nose right here, and the Will linebacker just blitzed in the A-gap, literally ran right to him. That should be an easy block, and he just, I don't know if he saw him late or he got on his back edge and he gave up a sack. Um, Those are plays that you normally, you know, would not have, but as you look at those sacks and then you look down the field, yeah, you know what, those are missed opportunities because somebody is open. I don't don't think, when I hear neighbors say, hey, look, you know, look at the film, I was open, every wide receiver worth a damn thinks he's open on every single play. So there's a little bit of that you got to kind of (laughs) like... Yeah, there's nothing you, you wrong with that comment. You gotta take that into account. You want a guy to think that he's open all the time. And you know, Chad Johnson used to say, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm seven eleven. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm always open. That's the mindset that you want in your receiver. Um, you know, I think he probably learned from that. That your choice of words in that situation can get word used against you. And I think that he would probably use a different terminology and, and a different context with that. Um, but I think, look, right out of the gate. First play of the game went to neighbors. Second, the, the first third down of the game went to neighbors. It was incomplete, but you know they're trying to get him involved early and often as they should. Yeah, and and you know to that point too about his comments, it, it you know hearing him say it in, in the context of the conversation, he wasn't pointing fingers. He was being a confident young wide receiver and saying, yeah. you know what, I was proud of myself. I got out of my breaks. I got I was open, and this is what I evaluate about my game from the day and, and that I think like you said in a sound bite taken outside of the context of the conversation can be taken out of you know twisted in a in a way that can be less flattering um and that's just tough that you know that people will will do that but yeah I you know I also like just want to remind people like Malik Neighbors is a rookie yeah so like the fact that he's after a game people are asking him questions about the offense and you know what should this be doing like dude he He's, tr- he's staying in his lane. He's worried about himself. He's worried yeah. about his job. Like, hey, I want to help the team. I want to make them better. Like, I-, I would never ask a rookie to to all of a sudden now you have to become the mouthpiece of the offense or you've got to teach these other guys what to do or tell them what to do. Like, that's, you know, that's asking too much of him. But, but I will say that, you know, like this is the time now, if you're the Giants, like let's see some leadership and let's see some guys on offense step up. The defense is doing their part. They're doing all they can. Like, I don't know what else they can do. I mean, maybe they have to score too. But offensively, like, let's go. I want to see some fire. Like, mm-hmm. I want to see some guys pissed off. And let's go. Let's do this. Like, there are enough veterans on that offense. And, you know, you need somebody to light a fire. And, like, let's hold each other accountable and let's go to work. And the value of doing that on a Monday night football stage can't be understated because of what it does, not just for the environment of the team, getting a win, getting, you know, or or having some productivity, but also kind of doing a lot to change the narrative around a team. Because I don't know about you, but, you know, when you're in a locker room and you hear the noise and the narrative around a team and you hear people saying, oh, Daniel Jones, one in 14 in prime time and, you know, seven straight prime time games that he hasn't run a touchdown pass and people are looking at that. And, and and saying okay what uh you know how can this team offensively get going 
you know, you have a successful performance on primetime that puts, you know, the league on notice. It's like, no, we do have this possibility. I think from watching this team, it's not so much that the skill set, but it's, it's the consistency in executing that seems to have been the issue for them. Yeah, the consistency is not there. And, you know, that goes hand in hand with confidence. Like if you're not consistently doing something, then you don't you kind of lose confidence in that. So, yeah, I do agree. I mean, look, the Giants need a win. And I don't care if it's on Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Tuesday, in London, in Germany. I don't care where it is. Like we just need a dub. Mm-hmm. But doing it on Monday night would be huge and obviously for daniel jones he's kind of into that category now that we used to put kirk cousins in yeah. every time kirk cousins was on prime time it was like oh my gosh here's his awful record and that becomes the meme well and Stafford now, was the same way but like, now cousins can is winning in prime time and people are still bringing up that narrative of like oh wow he won in prime time it's like no he's been doing that it right takes a while to shake that well up. and for kirk cousins like he would lose a prime time game and throw for 420 yards and right. four touchdowns but like they just were snake bit they lost you know a last second field goal or you know something crazy crazy would happen Stafford was the same way like Stafford couldn't win the big game he was you know awful in prime time then he goes to LA and then obviously they had that big run they win the Super Bowl and now nobody talks about that so yeah I, definitely this would be a great signature win for Daniel Jones it would be great for him to play well on the road and in prime time look you got Joe Buck and Troy Aikman in the booth um, Troy loves to talk about quarterbacks and good quarterback play so like you want to light it up and like he's going to reward you with that also let's not forget the Manning cast is going to be going on so you've got yeah. Eli and Peyton um, that are looking forward to, to breaking down some of this quarterback play so um, you know this is a perfect opportunity for you to do it um, and I think now it's just the matter of go out and do it like go out and perform this game look you, we used to say all the time like Doing things in practice is great, and that builds your confidence up. But you have to make the putt. You have to be able to make the putt with the tournament on the line. Like, can you do it? There's a lot of driving range champions. Like, hey, you go out of the driving range, and you know what? You're piping your 7-iron. You're sticking it every time. You're hitting your driver straight. You get out there on the course, and, like, guess what? Like, you know, you get a little loose. Like, you got to order, you know, give me give me that Casamigos Blanco. Like, I got I need my swing lube. Like, you got to you gotta find a way to just relax, goose fraba, whatever it is, and make the putt. Like, that's what yeah. you got to do. You drive for show and you putt for dough. Amen. You know? That's what you got to do. And the putt in this instance is the, the win? The win. All right. Yeah. Get the win. Uh, it's going to be tough, though, because, again, as we mentioned, the Pittsburgh offense is clicking. 37 points in Week 7 against the Jets. That's a season high. They're on back-to-back games in which they've had 30 or more points offensively. Uh, We're hitting them right at the perfect time, but <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they just they just clobbered the Jets. The offense has come to life, and yeah, now here we come. Like and we played three weeks ago when they were in dysfunctional, and you know it couldn't get out of their own way. That would have yeah. been easy. that would have been nice. Start of the season three and zero with three total touchdowns, and it's like okay, you know this is a different three and zero team. But now it's all right. It's full send. You got George Pickens. 100 yards receiving in two of the last four games. You got Najee Harris back to back 100 yard rushing games. Um, this offense is just uh, working out well. And, and you see the way that, you know, Russ has stepped in. Mike Tomlin talked about how, you know, I'm, I wasn't sure what the plan was, but you had to see if Russ was the guy. And, you know, if, if for when they go back to fields, it's fields for good at that point, he has said. Um, but the, the Russell Wilson experiment is working in, in so you know in, in the one game that we have seen so far. Yeah, I mean, look, Justin Fields started the season because Russell got hurt. Right. Like Russell beat him in training camp, and he was the starting quarterback, and then he had the calf injury that kind of lingered. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I'm, I think Justin Fields played well, you know, in the, in their first couple games, and you know they they won their first three games of the season and I think had they lost their first game or second game I think Russell probably would have been back in the lineup but you don't want to make the change when you're on a heater um you know I think Russell gives this offense a totally different dimension so um I think that's really the challenge now and you know as players we would always go back whenever we're playing a team you go back and watch their last four games well really now you only have you know really this one game with Russell Wilson to look at the other games with Justin Fields, that that offense was different. Like they yeah. were calling different plays. Um, you know, he saw the field differently. I think Russell is a different animal. So that's um, that's got to be more challenging to prepare for in that. It case. is, yeah, because you don't have as much ammo. You don't have as much material to go back and look on and say, all right, here are some tendencies. Here's what they're doing when they get this kind of pressure, when they get this kind of coverage, or here's what Russell, you know, is seeing well. Like he's, 
he's seen the nickel sand blitz. You know, every time somebody blitzes him on the nickel sand, and we've got four games of that, mm-hmm. he's thrown hot and he completed the first down. So we're going to hit him from the weak side. So those are tendencies that you try to look at, you know, over the last four games. What has really been an impact? Has it been, you know, blitzing up the middle? Has it been blitzing off the edge? Um, you know, those are all things that you can gather data on, but it's hard when it's it's only been one game. Right, right. So we'll see how uh, they put that together, at least the, on the defense or on the, yeah, defensive cut-ups. You know, they've got a little bit more. Like when you just look at the sack standpoint of it too, like I'm looking at their season stats, like Justin Fields was sacked 16 times mm-hmm. in his, what do you have, five, six games? He, he six played games, six yeah. games. So Russell Wilson, he was only sacked one time. So yeah. that tells you that he's getting the ball out. Right, and I was saying he's he's scrambling to throw the ball. He's not just running around um, trying to ad lib plays. Yeah, yeah. But again, it was one game against a Jets team that had recently gone through a coaching change, and you know there's a lot of uh, outliers in the preparation and in looking at that tape. Um, so a lot of questions remain as well. But Giants fans, the Giants official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to Big Blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and on the Giants mobile app. 201-939-4513 is the phone number. As we head back to the phone lines, Chris in North Carolina. Chris, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Sean and Madeline. Hey, guys. How you doing? Great. So listen, this is official Chris from North Carolina. I was up in Richmond, Virginia doing a college showcase, so I didn't get to see the Giants game. However... I got home, and on Monday I went back and I watched. And I still see the same problem. And i tell you what, as a Giants fan and longtime Giants fan, I am very frustrated with the head coach, with the team. And i got to tell you, I told you guys that we needed that bigger receiver, especially on third down. And you need an experienced route runner to do that job. To be able to make that happen. I don't know. I don't know where they're not seeing this. And I told you guys that we should not have cut Allen Robinson. You have Mike Williams right next door. Could be your next Foxville Burris. And Sean, you know, Eli, he had Kevin Ball that he could throw the ball down the seam or even outside to that was reliable, that was big, that he could make an over the shoulder throw to. I just don't understand why the Giants are not seeing this. Isaiah Hodgkins is not the answer because he's not an experienced route runner. You need experience. You need that. I don't know why they're not seeing this. And Daniel Jones, he is feeling the pressure in <clears throat> MetLife Stadium when he starts the game. He's just not himself. Somehow, that's got to reverse. And if it doesn't, he may not be able to change the way he is. But please. Somebody do something about getting a bigger wide receiver, especially on third down. I want to see it. If yeah. I don't, I probably won't call into this show again. But right uh, now, I'm kind of bad. I've I put- been a long time fan since I grew up in Connecticut. So I follow this team a lot, and sometimes I don't get to see their games, and I didn't this weekend. But, man, I'll tell you what, watching that tape, I was just totally demoralized. Thanks so much for the call, Chris. Appreciate it. Yeah, Chris, good stuff. Um, listen, I, I, mean, I, I feel your pain. I mean, look, Maddie and I had to sit up there and do the postgame show after that debacle, and we're like, all right, how are we going to handle this one? And, you know, and it's, it was tough. It, it was demoralizing, um, you know, on, on many levels. Uh, I think the lack of production offensively has been the most frustrating part because the defense has been playing well. I mean, they've – you know, they held Cincinnati to 17 points. It was really just 10 until that long run. Mm-hmm. Um, and you do that at home, and you should be winning games. Like, your offense should be functional. It should be able to score touchdowns. Um, look, I, I, I think anybody would love to have a huge, you know, target at wide receiver. But it's not just that. Like, it's can he get separation? Can he get open? Um, you know, as we're talking about this, you know, the Giants would love to have a receiver. You know, it's the same day that the Chiefs just traded for DeAndre Hopkins, you know, and it's like that guy was on the trade block. And, you know, I don't know, you'd love to get a guy like that, you know, And but is he a red zone target? Um, look, I think Jalen Hyatt is, is a very complimentary receiver alongside Malik Neighbors. You know, Darius Slayton has had a couple of good games. The problem is just like we need a more consistent 
play. Like Madeline was talking about before, like you've got to be consistent. And too many times somebody will have a good game and then like they disappear. Like right. where are they? And we're, we're having that kind of up and down performance at receiver. And as I said before, like it's not all on the quarterback. You can't blame him for every single thing. We tend to do that because that's just the nature of the beast and they are the highest paid player. So, you know, you blame the head coach, you blame the quarterback first, and then everybody else kind of falls in line after that. But if guys aren't getting open, where are you supposed to throw the ball? And there's too many times where there has been time for Daniel Jones to throw the ball and nobody got open. So I, I feel you. I will say you or mentioned Kevin Boss. The ball was dropped, right. Um, you know, it's also it's all functional, right? Third and twelve. Like it's hard to really, you know, come up with play, plays every single game that can convert on third and twelve. Third and three and third and four, you know, it's a little bit easier to convert on that. Um, but you brought up Kevin Boss, um, who was a good buddy of mine, uh, a great tight end for the Giants, um, made some unbelievable catches, and and I think for the Giants, that's part of the reason why they went out and got Theo Johnson. Mm -hmm. Like that's kind of the the mold that you want at tight end. And he's been pretty good. I think he, he's very athletic. He's got great hands. We saw the touchdown um, that he had against Philly. You know, was called back because of pass interference. That's something that he'll learn to get better at as a veteran and as he grows. But um, I think that that, you know, that position, um, him alongside Daniel Bellinger, like Bellinger has shown us that, that he can be a, a capable receiver as well. Um, I think Theo is the guy that they want to be that kind of stretch the field down the seam kind of tight end. Well, and Chris mentioned, too, the need for experience. But all of these experienced pass catchers were at one point rookies, at one point in experience. And, you know, he highlighted Isaiah Hodgins, who, you know, how quickly we forget that two years ago was an integral part in that passing game in the yeah. Giants team that went to a postseason uh, and won a playoff game. And so Isaiah Hodgins, who is, you know, has been elevated from the practice squad this year in moments of need, um, you know, nothing to scoff at as well. But, you know, with experience, sometimes you have to find someone who has that experience. And sometimes you do that and it doesn't work out as we've seen in years past with certain receivers the Giants have tried that have had some experience and that haven't panned out in the building. Um, and then, you know, you sometimes you want to home grow that experience. And as, you know, like you mentioned with Theo Johnson, you know, these teachable moments. Okay, he gets that touchdown, but he gets called for the OPI. That's something he'll go back to the tape. He'll learn how to strategically manage that coverage a little bit better so he's not getting flagged for it. It reminds me of, I remember in high school when I really, you know, I started working and you want to get a job for the first time. And I thought, you know what I want to do? I want to go get a job at a restaurant. That would be so much fun. And every restaurant you apply for is like, you know what? You need to have previous restaurant experience. And I'm finally, I was like, how do you get previous restaurant experience if no restaurant's going to hire you without previous experience? Yeah, you, you lie. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, uh, I am a sous chef. It's like, man, yeah. this is a, a, a hostess yes. position. <laughs> I, wor I worked at a buffet. Yeah. <laughs> what did you do? I served water. I ate. <laughs> I have experience. That's all you asked for. I have experience. But, you know, it's a different point with these, you know, you want a pass catcher that has experience. Sometimes you have to give those players the experience and let them grow in-house. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, look, we, we have experienced guys. I mean, Darius Slayton, yeah. you know, I mean, he's a veteran. Um, you know, Jalen Hyde's in his second year. Um, you know, I think that that's definitely a part of it. But, you know, this is a young team. Like, you, you defensively, we're, we're a young team. Um you know, this is kind of, this is some of the growing pains that you go through as you're trying to build that team for longevity. Yeah. Every four years, the world watches. Every corner kick, every save, every pass. The world watches its most beautiful game played at its highest level. And for a moment, the world stops turning for soccer. Bank of America is proud to be the official bank sponsor of FIFA World Cup 2026. Supporting possibilities turned into achievements on the biggest stage. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America NA, member FDIC. Exactly. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we head back to the phone lines. Cliff in New York. Cliff, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Madeline and Sean. Hey, how you doing? Uh, uh, what time did you start? We started at 1 today because uh, there was some media availabilities with the players at 1230 that pushed us back production-wise. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, well, anyway, I, I missed the first few minutes, uh, so um, what, I, what I wanted to, uh, my, my big take from the Eagles game um, was that there was, while we have made a dent, you know, in uh, the talent gap in the division, 
between us and the Cowboys and us and the Eagles. What was striking about the Eagles game was how far ahead of us they still were in the trenches on both sides of the ball. And, uh, and the best thing that I heard was from you guys in the post game because I had thought I had seen that Azudu looked better after the first couple of plays, and I heard you guys say he did. So I was glad to hear that. And, um, you know, it kind of leads into us being a young team, like you were just saying. Um, uh, Izudu and Neil are both in effect in their second year. Um, and uh, on the other side of the ball, Jordan Riley, who was called out for Saquon's run up the middle for, for being pushed over two gaps. I don't know if one lineman did that or if two did that. Uh, but, um, again, he, he was a, a young guy in his second year who hasn't seen a lot of action, but they liked him, uh, you know, as a day three pick. Uh, you're supposed to be able to find good trench people on day three or at least later in day two. And, um, and they, they just said it's really hard to find a guy who's that big and that athletic, but can he actually play defensive lineman is another story. So they have to find out. So I'm hoping they didn't write him off yet. It was a little discouraging to hear that when Dex went out, we were in big trouble. I thought I had seen a lot from DJ. Anyway, I, the fan base doesn't want to hear too much about that it takes time. I, I know when you, when you want a big receiver that's experienced, guess how much those people cost? Th those people cost as, uh, as much as an edge rusher and uh, if they're experienced. So... Um, I, I I was encouraged by 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 Yuzuru. I'm thinking uh, to get Evan on the field. Oh, there's this mysterious thing called rhythm on offense. I heard it from Phil Sims first. He just said flat out one time a couple of years ago, rhythm offense is rhythm, and and I heard Daniel say that that he he takes some responsibility for that. But on that play to Slayton, where everybody said Slayton dropped the ball, I could see as an amateur. Daniel did not set his feet, you know, and why, you know, he, oh, he was, nobody was near him, and he still didn't set his feet. Well, they, they, you guys have taught us that that's what happens when you get hit 10 times. When you're not being hit, you, you're still not normal. So I'm just trying to put all those things together and feel a little bit more optimistic here because uh, I'm still all in. Well, that's good. We're glad that you're still all in, and, and you're right, too. I mean, you're getting hit that, that frequently, even when you're not getting hit, you're, you're bracing for impact a little bit, Sean. Yeah, yeah, appreciate the call, Cliff. Uh, I think that's Cliff from last week, too. Like, he, he's, he's a regular. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. appreciate you tuning in. And, uh, we're, again, we're sorry for the audible on, on the time. But, um, you know, no excuse for you being late, though. Like, if it's supposed to start at 1230, how are you – How you should have been early. You should have been there on time. Like, Schmelk uh, and I both tweeted out the update. And yeah. Sean did, too. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, we're having some fun with you, Cliff. Um Look, I, I get it, and I feel like the, the, the tough thing right now for Giants fans, like you mentioned time, like we don't want to hear that it takes time. I get it. Like in New York, like none of us have time, right? We're all rushing to get somewhere. We're rushing to get the job. We're rushing to get to school. We're rushing to get back to school, back to the job, back home. Like time is so precious around here. And I think, you know, I, I get it. I think everybody in this building is frustrated with that because we thought we would be further along when they hired Joe Shane and Brian Dable, we thought by year three, we wouldn't be in this situation. Um, certainly not offensively, because when Brian Dable was hired, it was like, hey, can we reproduce what Buffalo did? Can we reproduce that offense? You were the offensive coordinator. Let's do that here. And it just has not come to fruition. Um, you know, look, there's not a singular blame for that. I think it's a collective blame, and everybody has to try to find a way to do something about it. There is no magic wand. We talked about this on the post-game show. There is no cavalry coming. Like, everybody mm -hmm. wants a big target receiver. Guess what? Even if you traded for a guy right now, that's not going to fix the entire offense. So how do you find a way to get the most out of the guys that we have right now? That, I think, is the challenge for this coaching staff, and it's a challenge for these players. Here's who we are. We are not a team that's going to blow people out 35 to 31. We have to find a way to win games. We got to find a way in order to win a game. You got to get into the fourth quarter, mm -hmm. and you got to have. It's got to be a winnable game in the fourth quarter. You can't lose it in the first three. 
Um, I used to have a saying, I used to tease Eli all the time, like, hey, man, you can't win the game in the first half, but you could sure as hell lose it for us. Like, don't mess it up. Like, if you throw three picks in the first half, you, you, like, that's probably an L. You could throw three touchdowns in the first half, and you're still losing the game if you don't find a way to, to close it out. So that's what this team just needs to learn. And, you know, I think it, it is frustrating. It's frustrating for fans. It's frustrating for us as we're covering the Giants and doing the postgame show. Look, it's frustrating for the people in the locker room, the people in the building. Like, they spend a lot of time. Like, these coaches spend a lot of time away from their families yeah. in preparation, trying to help these players put their best foot forward, and it just has not worked out. I will say this. Misery loves company. Like, look around the league. Like, th there are a lot of teams in this same situation that are struggling, mm -hmm. that have players, have good players, have good coaches, and it's just not coming together. You mentioned rhythm. Like, I always felt like, as an offense, like you've got to be in sync, like you've got to be working as one. And yes, it is a rhythm. It's it's like a concert. If the tuba player is on a different page and hitting a different pitch, it throws everybody off. Like you got to have your wind instruments lined up with your string instruments. You know, you got it's got to be an acapella here. You can't have too many baritones, too many altos. I'm going into my musical knowledge here right now, I which mean, is very limited, the range but that's it. of knowledge from Sean O'Hara, we've got golf analogies, we've got yeah. orchestral analogies. I mean, I feel like on the show, there's a crescendo. You know, you, you know? start out here and then you just kind of... This you is know. your opus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thanks, Cliff. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's a great call, Cliff. But I mean, to your point, too, Sean, it's like the the Giants are going to need to be competitive and consistently competitive in this game, but also, you know, not let go of the reins, especially in the second half. Not get into a, a deep hole in the first half, but especially if they keep it even. Kill. I mean, Pittsburgh has outscored teams by sixty eight points in the second half this season. Mm. One hundred four to thirty six in the second half mm. of games this season. So. When you say, oh, they're a second half team? Yeah. Absolutely. And so not getting into a point in the first half where that's going to completely blow it out of the water is important. Um, and not letting that happen and kind of continuing to stay the course for all four quarters of the game. Yeah. I mean, and that's huge. You, you look at, you know, the Pittsburgh Steelers have been somewhat of a gold standard in the NFL. Like when you, you know, Mike Tomlin had you know how many straight seasons of, of, of above 500 record like that consistency is there and that consistency is what has bred championships for that organization the second half that and that is the biggest part of every nfl game like the first half you go out there you play you want to you know you want to make some plays you're figuring each other out you're figuring out what they what they're doing maybe they're doing something different and then the second half is when you win the game so mm -hmm. you've got to be playing your best football in the fourth quarter but you've got to be able to be within striking distance. And I think that's a credit to Mike Tomlin and his staff and what they've been able to do. But it's also the players that realize, okay, like fourth quarter, it's another notch. Like you got to crank it up another notch, um, you know, on the intensity level. Um, and unfortunately for the Giants, like that, that has always been the case. You know, it's not always within reach in the fourth quarter. Um, I think the way the defense is playing, like th these games have been winnable if you score points. But – you can, you know, they start to lose confidence in you when they're coming off the field and they're halfway through their Gatorade and they're like, you know, defense, you're up, you know, like punt return, here we go already. And, yeah. you know, you start to get that sideways look from them when you're not holding your up, holding up your end of the bargain. Well, we'll see how it all goes down Monday night in Pittsburgh. The terrible towels will be waving. We'll be on Giants post game. This week it's Amani on the post game show. Yeah, I think I'm the bush. I, think, I mean, I, think I will we got just, a shot now. I will just tell fans who are listening that Amani Toomer has been on the post game show after the Washington game, mm. the Cleveland game, and the Seattle game. Right. Um, so he's two and one. He's two and one, and then the Washington game was a close one. Yeah, that's why he's the goat. Um, but you know what? We'll see. We'll see what the we're you, all we're all. You've just, been on all of them. So I've been on all of them. So, so my record is so what's your terrible. <laughs> I'm two and zero on the road, yeah. and I'm going to Pittsburgh. Oh, oh there, right, we there we go, Pearson. Pearson. You're the ringer. Get, get the ringer in there. Just get her done. Do my part. I mean, see Pearson doing it for the Giants fans out here. All right. the, the, quick, quick shout out. You're going. To, you're going to Pittsburgh, Pierce, right? Correct. You got to try one of the, I think it's Permani Brothers. Okay. Right. That's their like their known sandwich. Like when you go to Pittsburgh, it's like a panini sandwich. It's like, but they put the fries, the coleslaw, everything's all like lumped in between the bread. Yum. Um, they're I think they're like a I think Reuben, per, Permani but with Brothers. 
Yeah, it's like, I mean, it's like sourdough bread, uh -huh. like so big, thick piece of bread. But it's like if you want a pastrami, if you get a roast beef, if you want a turkey, uh, Permani Brothers, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's the, the name of the sandwich. Um, they had it in Cleveland. They call them paninis, I think. But you, they put like this coleslaw on it, the French fries. Everything goes in the middle of the sandwich. Well, what else is on there besides coleslaw and French fries? Meat. Like, uh, no, like turkey. <laughs> oh, okay. You could do pastrami. Just a coleslaw um, yeah. French fry Cheese. sandwich. Here. I mean, it's like it, it's right. it's a big sandwich, but I mean, it's it's loaded. I'll check it out. It's loaded. Yeah, you definitely want to get in on that. Amazing. Get yeah, get some Instagram content of that as well. You, you know, do it for the do it for the people. Just one bite. Just one bite. You know the <laughs> <Yeah>. rules. <laughs> It'll be a good one. All right. Well, Pearson in Pittsburgh. That's got a nice ring to it. It's it's right. It's like Emily in Paris, but better. And uh, we'll see if it brings you know some success for this Giants team in a very very tough matchup on Monday Night Football. But we'll be continuing to preview it and monitor everything as the news comes down. Giants, of course, uh, not practicing today because this week is you know shifted because of the Monday Night schedule. So they'll be on the practice field tomorrow, Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, we'll walk through on Sunday, then flying out to Pittsburgh and game night Monday night. That's a wrap for our show today on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Thanks for listening to today's episode, which is part of the Giants podcast platforms everywhere. Giants.com slash podcast. Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac. For Sean O'Hara, I'm Madeline Burke. We'll see you next time. This fall, watch all your live TV on Hulu Plus Live TV. Watch your favorite sports, local channels, news, and tons of must-watch shows. You'll also get access to Hulu's entire streaming library with Disney Plus and ESPN Plus included. As a special offer, you can get Hulu Plus Live TV now for just $59.99 per month for three months. Don't wait. Get Hulu Plus Live TV today. Ends 11 19 Hulu with ads plus live TV plan only. $59.99 per month for three months, then $82.99 per month, or then current regular monthly price. Access content from each service separately. Eligibility restrictions and terms apply. Wake up at Holiday Inn Express to a can't-miss breakfast that's free with every stay. Count on all the hot, fresh coffee you need and an incredible breakfast buffet that has something for everyone, like eggs, cinnamon rolls, and even hot, fresh pancakes with all the toppings you crave. Next time, do yourself a favor and stay at a Holiday Inn Express with a can't-miss breakfast that's free with every stay. So, when you wake up at Holiday Inn Express, you'll wake up happy, a part of IHG Hotels and Resorts.